Welcome to Fuvi's Solid Courses Demos. Hot AI 15-minute lecture based on MIT 8.04, Quantum Physics 1. Lecture 1, Introduction to Quantum Mechanics, Part 1, taught by Professor Barton Zwiebach. The voice is AI dubbed from Professor Zwiebach's original lecture. Welcome to Lecture 1, Introduction to Quantum Mechanics, Part 1. After this 15-minute lecture, you will clearly grasp three key concepts in quantum mechanics. One, linearity. Two, the necessity of complex numbers. And three, loss of determinism. We begin with feature number one, the linearity of quantum mechanics. Linearity is a fundamental feature of quantum mechanics. What does this mean? First, practically, it means that if you have two solutions, you can form a third by adding them. You don't need to change anything and simply combine them, and you get a new solution. A well-known example of linearity is Maxwell's theory of electromagnetism. If you have two plane waves propagating in different directions, adding them gives you a third solution. Two waves propagating simultaneously without affecting each other. This feature is extraordinarily useful in practice. Millions of phone calls, data streams, and video transmissions can travel simultaneously without interfering with one another. In the next slide, I will introduce two key properties of linearity that make this possible. Two key properties of linearity. Now, let me show you the linearity in Maxwell's theory mentioned above in more detail. Suppose you have an electric field E a magnetic field B, a charge density rho, and a current density J. This set of data forms a solution to Maxwell's equations. Linearity implies the following. 1. Scaling property. If this is a solution, then multiplying it by a constant real number alpha, giving you alpha E, alpha B, alpha rho, and alpha J, is also a valid solution. Number two is the additivity property. If you have two solutions, E1, B1, Rho1, J1, and E2, B2, Rho2, J2, then their sum, E1 plus E2, B1 plus B2, Rho1 plus Rho2, and J1 plus J2, is also a valid solution. In summary, if we have two solutions, we can add them. And if we have a single solution, we can scale it by a number. In the next slides, I will show you linear equations and the properties that make them linear. Linear equation. A linear equation is written as L of u equals zero, where u is the unknown and L is a linear operator. If you have several operators, L1, L2, L3, and so on, you will have several equations. L1 of u equals zero, L2 of u equals zero, L3 of u equals zero, and so on. If you have multiple unknowns, such as u, v, w, etc., the equation may take the form L of u, v, w equals zero. Properties of linear equations. Here are the key properties of linear equations and their meanings. If L of u equals zero and a is a number, L of a times u equals a times L of u, then all equals zero. Meaning, if u is a solution, then a times u is also a solution. If LU1 equals zero and LU2 equals zero, then LU1 plus U2 equals LU1 plus LU2 equals zero. Meaning, if U1 and U2 are solutions, then U1 plus U2 is also a solution. If L of U1 equals zero and L of U2 equals zero, and alpha and beta are numbers, then L of alpha U1 plus beta U2 equals alpha L of U1 plus beta L of U2, then equals zero. Meaning, if U1 and U2 are solutions, then alpha U1 plus beta U2 is also a solution. In the next slides, I will show you how to determine the linear operator L and how to use these properties. Determine L and check linearity. Let's look at this equation. du over dt plus 1 over tau u equals 0. If we define L u equal du over dt plus 1 over tau multiplies u. Then this equation can be written as L u equals 0. How do we write L on its own? Structurally, we can express it as L equals d over dt plus 1 over tau. 
Here, d over dt is the derivative operator, and 1 over tau simply multiplies u. To verify that L has linearity, you first replace u with au. We get L on au would be d dt of au plus 1 over tau au, which is a times du over dt, plus 1 over tau u, which is alu. Then, if you replace u with u1 plus u2, similarly, you will also get L on u1 plus u2 is equal to LU1 plus LU2. L has both scaling and additivity properties. So it is linear. Now, our main topic, Schrodinger's equation. I h bar d dt of psi is equal to h hat psi. Here, psi is the wave function. h hat, the Hamiltonian, is a linear operator as explained in another video. I is the imaginary unit, and h hat is Planck's constant divided by 2 pi. H hat is just a number. If you define L psi as I h bar d dt of psi minus h hat psi, then you can write Schrodinger's equation in the form L psi equals zero. You can check that L is a linear operator, therefore Schrodinger's equation and quantum mechanics is linear. In that sense, quantum mechanics is actually simpler than classical mechanics, more elegant, more beautiful, more coherent, and very nice. However, because the wave function is complex, no physical interpretation was obvious to the people who invented quantum mechanics. It was even a bit funny. Schrodinger wrote down this equation, and when asked, so what is the wave function? He said, I don't know. It took a few months until Max Born proposed using the norm of the wave function to describe the probability of a particle state. That's why our next slide is the necessity of complex numbers in quantum mechanics. The necessity of complex numbers. The complex number i is defined as the square root of minus 1. So i squared equals minus 1. It was invented to solve equations like x squared equals minus 1. From i, people created more numbers by combining it with regular real numbers. For example, you can have a complex number z equals a plus ib. Here a is the real part, and b is the imaginary part. We also define the complex conjugate of z, denoted as z star. z star is equal to a minus ib. If you multiply z by z star, that's a plus ib times a minus ib, you get a squared plus b squared, and that's a real number. If we display a complex number on the plane, a is on the x-axis, b is on the y-axis. Then the complex number z is this vector. The norm squared is equal to a squared plus b squared. That's also z times z star, as we mentioned earlier. So that's complex numbers. People use them in electromagnetism and sometimes even in classical mechanics. However, in those cases, everything in the equations, like the electric field, position, or velocity, is real. So the use of complex numbers is just auxiliary. On the other hand, in quantum mechanics, the equation already has an eye. Psi is a complex number necessarily, and you can never measure it. This was the issue of the physical interpretation. Max Born had the breakthrough idea, use the norm as described above, to measure the probabilities of the wave function. That was a great discovery, and it had a lot to do with the development of quantum mechanics. In summary, we can't determine the exact physical state of a wave function. We can only measure probabilities. This leads us to a key feature of quantum mechanics called the loss of determinism, which we'll explore in the next slide. Photons and the loss of determinism. What are photons? According to Maxwell's equations, everyone knew that light was a wave. Nevertheless, Planck and Einstein's work on the photoelectric effect showed that light is made of quanta. These quanta of light are called photons. So photons are packets of energy. And a photon is a particle, a quantum mechanical particle. Let's now compare quantum and Newtonian particles. There is an important difference between a particle in Newtonian mechanics and in quantum mechanics. In Newton's view, a particle is an object that carries energy, has zero size, and has a precise position and velocity at any time. 
In quantum mechanics, a particle is just an indivisible amount of energy or momentum that propagates with no definite position or velocity. And most profoundly, it reflects the loss of determinism. Let's explore this in the next slide. Photon energy, wavelength, and polarizers. That's all we need to understand the loss of determinism. Einstein realized that for a photon, the energy E is given by H times nu, where nu is the frequency of the light, and frequency times wavelength equals the speed of light. So the wavelength of the light is determined by the energy of each photon. If you have a beam of light, which is billions of identical photons, and if the energy of each photon changes, the wavelength of the beam changes accordingly. Let's see what happens if a beam of light hits a polarizer. So what is a polarizer? It has a preferential direction. Let me align that preferential direction with the x-axis, meaning if I send light that is linearly polarized along the x-axis, it all goes through. The light that comes out is identical to the light that came in. The frequency doesn't change. The wavelength doesn't change. It's the same light, the same energy. If I send light linearly polarized along the y-axis, nothing goes through. It all gets absorbed. So far, so good. Now let's imagine sending light linearly polarized at some angle alpha, and you'll see a profound phenomenon called the loss of determinism, as I'll show you next. As you've studied electromagnetism, we send an electric field E alpha, which is E0 cosi alpha x hat plus E0 psi alpha y hat. After the polarizer, E is just E0 cosi alpha x hat. That's all that is left after the polarizer. The fraction of energy that goes through is cosi squared alpha, and the fraction of energy that doesn't go through is 1 minus cosi squared alpha. But now, think what this means for photons. This light beam is made up of identical photons, maybe billions of photons, all identical, sent over one by one. After the polarizer, the color doesn't change. The energy of each photon must stay the same. So, this fraction must be the fraction of photons that go through, and this fraction must be the fraction of photons that don't go through. All photons are identical. So whatever happens to one photon should happen to all. Either it gets absorbed or it goes through. But why does it happen differently here? A fraction of photons go through, while the rest don't. It's a total disaster for classical physics. So, possible ways out. 1. The polarizer might have a substructure, but that's not true. 2. Maybe the photon has some hidden variable, a property we don't know about. That was the hidden variable theory. But in 1964, John Bell showed that quantum mechanics can't be made deterministic with hidden variables. So at the end of the day, we've lost determinism. Photons either get through or not. We can only predict probabilities. Because of this loss of determinism, how do we write the states of a photon? Let's see next. Notation of photon states. In 1939, Dirac invented a notation to describe a photon polarized in the x direction, photon colon x, and this symbol. This notation represents a vector of a possible state of a photon polarized along the x direction. Similarly, this notation describes a photon polarized in the y direction. And linearity means that there can exist a state called cosi alpha photon x plus psi alpha photon y. And this is the photon state polarized in the alpha direction. Compare with the classical equation. What you lose here is the E0 because this is the equation for one photon. After the polarizer, the photon is only in the state photon x because the y direction doesn't go through. When it goes through, the whole photon goes through. So there's no need for a cosi alpha here. And that's the state of the photon that goes out of the polarizer. In summary, we can't determine whether a single photon goes through or gets absorbed, only the probability. This marks the loss of determinism. We'll explore even more profound features of quantum physics, quantum superposition and quantum entanglement in lecture two. For now, lecture one ends here. Thank you for watching.